On today's episode, SpaceX has a new problem, NASA has a new problem, and the race to mine asteroids is heating up. Following on from recent conversations about the ongoing investigation of the problems with the heat shield on NASA's Orion space capsule, a new report from an independent watchdog organization released on May 1st shows that the Artemis program might be about to face another long delay. Previously, NASA engineers were baffled as to why the pod that flew in the uncrewed Artemis 1 mission back in 2022 returned to Earth with an uneven pattern of wear, but this report goes on to say that the Artemis team has found more than 100 cracks where there shouldn't be. Orion, like many space capsules, uses an ablative material for its heat shield, meaning that it's designed to absorb the heat of re-entry and flake off harmlessly instead of transferring that heat to the pod and its contents. So when NASA's engineers found that the char layer had instead been cracking and breaking in larger pieces, well, they knew this was not just a random wear pattern problem anymore. No damage to the crew module itself has been found, however, larger chunks of ablative material would form a trail of dangerous debris rather than turning into flakes of ash. These chunks can then hit the pod or, more likely, tear through its parachutes, potentially causing the total loss of the vehicle and any crew on board. Obviously, this heat shield issue is the top priority out of the six total issues outlined in the report, and while NASA still isn't certain what exactly is causing the problem, they do have some ideas that could solve it. The first would be to slow down the re-entry speeds. Artemis 1 was already using one of the fastest re-entry profiles for a crew-capable vehicle, and the next missions will reportedly be even faster, reaching speeds of up to 25,000 miles per hour and generating temperatures of about 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's possible that this might be too much for even the robust coating that NASA uses for Orion's heat shield, so slowing the re-entry profile could do the trick. The next is a little more obvious, and that is to find a whole new material that could withstand the current Artemis flight path. And that does sound like a no-brainer, but the problem is that this would be a very time-consuming and costly procedure, which would spur even more tests than any other solution, and it still might not work. The last option comes from the report's recommendation itself. It says very specifically that NASA should ensure the root cause of Orion heat shield char liberation is well understood prior to the launch of the Artemis II mission. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the team needs to replace anything or rework any flight plans. Since NASA doesn't really know why this cracking is even happening, it is possible that the engineers could find a reason that has a relatively simple fix and allows them to keep using their current heat shield. However, it is a bit of a long shot at this point. So, there's not really a good answer here. Each of these options carry their own dangers and expensive setbacks for a mission that has already been delayed into 2025, and that's still only the first issue in the report. NASA also needs to look into a different overheating issue involving the separation bolts on the service module that is normally jettisoned just before re-entry. While giving the Orion its inspection, NASA teams found an unexpected amount of melting that caused a dangerous gap to form on Orion after the separation. The report also points out that NASA's mobile launcher for their SLS rocket was unacceptably damaged during the 2022 Artemis 1 flight, specifically the imaging equipment, which the agency uses to help conduct investigations and collect useful data for later launches. The last three recommendations all involve the recovery of the pod at the end of the process, and NASA has reportedly done a great job at making sure those issues have been taken care of. New systems always take a fair bit of work, and we're all used to seeing much larger lists of suggested safety improvements to be made before a rocket can launch, but if NASA can't figure out this issue with their heat shield, it will take more time to fix, which could throw off the entire Artemis mission timeline again. A study released on May 2nd has concluded that there is a big problem at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It's not big enough. More specifically, the report says that the port and road facilities that service America's biggest space center are in danger of being overwhelmed within the next few years as the ever-increasing amount of commercial and military activity grows. The biggest factor in these concerns is obviously SpaceX, which currently uses the Canaveral port for their drone ships and other barges that deliver boosters, capsules, and other parts coming and going from the company's facilities at KSC. 
But in addition to SpaceX, the United Launch Alliance, Blue Origin, and Relativity Space all make regular use of the port, with Blue Origin and Relativity set to increase their operation footprint at the spaceport over the next few years. And of course, the whole facility belongs to NASA and the US government, who operate their own flights and recovery operations there as well. The report attempts to offer a basic plan for expansion that covers the near and short terms, a span of time going from the next 5 to 10 years all the way out to 50 years from now. The expansion plans in this report are entirely centered around infrastructure expansion, dredging the middle turning basin, making this well-trafficked area of the port's waterway larger and adding a whole new wharf to accommodate the growing volume of shipping. Later parts of the plan involve digging this particular basin further northward to allow for even more shipping over the course of the next 50 years. Adjoining roadways would also have to be expanded to help offload all the new cargo faster, but the real focus is on dredging and building the new wharfs, which are very expensive prospects. And it's likely going to have to happen pretty soon. On May 10th, the Federal Aviation Administration announced that they were going to be conducting a more in-depth review of SpaceX and the impact their Starship rockets might have on the environment surrounding the Kennedy Space Center. A preliminary environmental assessment had been made by NASA back in 2019. The FAA says that this was more of a baseline and that things have progressed enough with the new SpaceX Super Heavy vehicle that they would need to conduct a proper environmental impact statement before they could be cleared to fly from the Cape. And that's actually a good thing. It means that SpaceX is a lot closer to being able to launch from the Florida coast than it might seem, and possibly the new report on the spaceport expansion has spurred all the regulatory bodies involved to get their paperwork done before people start getting grumpy with them about holding up any launches. This expansion plan is certainly a lot of hefty labor, but it is a relatively simple plan. Widening the major waterway used by the commercial companies at KSC would go a long way to easing that particular bottleneck and allow for increased pace of some lighter operations. There's no word on when work will officially start, of course, but the idea is to get funding for the whole thing using federal transportation grants. Otherwise, NASA would have to pay for the work by raising the fees on local shipping, which would sort of defeat the point. But that's not likely to happen. The space race is heating up and it makes sense for the US government to support the growth of their spaceport, lest they fall behind rivals like China. Commercial space companies are gearing up to try their hand at the next great frontier of resource hunting, mining asteroids. The idea is hardly new, landing on or capturing any of the rocky, mineral-rich asteroids that float around our solar system has been an idea in science fiction and in actual mission planning for decades now. Many of these rocks are filled with extremely precious materials like platinum and cobalt, which are used in electronics and batteries for electric vehicles. Even the ice that forms on comets, for instance, could be used to make propellant for our spacecraft. But despite the allure of grabbing these materials, nothing's been done in the field until very recently. This is because of two big reasons, really. The first is cost. Up until the last decade or so, the price of launching a rocket was prohibitively expensive, allowing only the richest commercial companies with government connections to afford a launch, and that meant that the very small amount of material that could be brought back from any of these asteroids just wouldn't have been worth the effort. But with the recent push to get back to the moon by all the major launch-capable governments of the world and their commercial partners, the second big reason has been dragged into the spotlight. We just don't have laws for this yet. What we do have is a loose framework of international agreements like the 1967 Outer Space Treaty and best practices outlined in documents like the Artemis Accords that all work together to make sure that no one can really claim anything out in space. The problem is that until those new accords, it wasn't really clear if it was even legal for a company to mine anything. The older Outer Space Treaty did lay the groundwork, however, saying that while no one could claim a part of a non-terrestrial body, they could lay claim to any material they dug up. That's what has led to more modern legislation that backs up a country or company's right to own anything they collect out in space, and so mining seems to be something that's protected, whether on the moon or elsewhere. And there are, of course, a lot more reasons than just these two, like the sheer amount of new technology making it easier to visit and dig on the moon, Mars, or asteroids and comets 
as well as just a ton more data and telemetry we've gathered since the 60s that helped to pinpoint valuable space rocks. And with newer environmental legislations designed to stop harmful mining practices here, it's slowly becoming more profitable to mine in space. All of these factors are creating a perfect storm for new companies to pop up with the explicit goal to find and mine asteroids within the next decade or so. Astroforge launched a test satellite in April of last year, which attempted to process some simulated asteroid material in orbit, and they are planning a second mission to survey a target asteroid next. A company called TransAstra is developing software and observation hardware that can find and track objects moving across the sky. A Chinese group named Origin Space is doing something similar with orbiting satellites while testing out some space mining equipment for later use. Colorado-based Carmen Plus plans to send a probe with excavation capabilities to an asteroid in 2026. The Asteroid Mining Corporation has developed a six-legged robotic explorer with the Tohoku University in Japan which can navigate in microgravity and take samples. They are planning to test it on the moon in 2026. This is almost exactly the sort of explosion of innovation we saw as rocket production and launches became more affordable, a bunch of large and small companies throwing everything they could at the wall and making a ton of prototypes to test their ideas with. This could very well be the start of a much larger industry, so keep an eye on the sky.